Good evening, and welcome to Talking Volumes. I'm Stephanie Curtis, Director of Programming for NPR News. From COVID-19 to climate change, to the economic downturn, to injustices in our policing and legal system, the most pressing issues we face in America are disproportionately affecting people of color. So for this series, we're bringing together a diverse group of authors to talk about their books, which all provide unique insights on America's racial divide. We have poets Reginald Dwayne Betts and M. Scott Mamaday and novelist Chang Ray Lee and Naima Coster. You can get more information on the series, links to local booksellers, and tickets to all Talking Volumes events at mprevents.org. Tonight, we will have a 60-minute in-depth interview with the author, followed by a panel discussion presented by our partners at Star Tribune. If you haven't had a chance, check out the author profile at startribune.com. You can also listen to the radio broadcast of this interview on NPR News Friday at 9 a.m. We'd like to thank our generous sponsors, Thomson Reuters, for their support. Now, please welcome award-winning journalist and your host for this evening, Carrie Miller. Welcome to a special winter season of Talking Volumes. I'm Carrie Miller. Sometimes an editor will include a letter along with the advance copy of a new novel. And it's really a way of setting the table for a critic or a bookstore owner or someone like me who's reading ahead of the publication date. So I skim these and then I usually eagerly turn to page one. But I have to say that a sentence from Naima Coster's editor caught my eye because I had such a different experience of this terrific new novel. So the editor wrote, these past few months have seen so many moments of rage and despair for which I personally found this novel to be a balm. A balm. I mean, for me, this novel was anything but a soothing, quieting, calming balm. And I'm eager to talk to Naima Coster about why. So the new novel is titled What's Mine and Yours. And she's with us today. Welcome. It's great to see you. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me, Carrie. I could hear you kind of chuckling because I think you knew where I was going on that. I mean, this novel, there's remorse, guilt, ambition, painful self-awareness, conflict. I mean, I felt like it was exhausting and exhilarating to be in this novel. And I didn't want it to end. And we'll talk about that a little later. But um, but I didn't see this as a balm. Uh, I, I'm curious about how you how you hear my reaction to this, what you make of that. Well, it makes a lot of sense to me to hear that because I can't say that in writing the book, I felt that it was a bomb, (laughs) but there was something cathartic about finding space in the book for all of the difficult experiences of the characters and all of the different experiences that led me to the writing of the book. I mean, I, I was thinking there is layer upon layer of human conflict and human emotion. And you do this so effortlessly. It doesn't feel like she's thrown everything in here she can think of to make just some big, uh, you know, some big brew of human emotion. But I also wondered kind of when is enough enough? And do you ask yourself, what can I really mix in to keep this authentic? And well, and to not exhaust the the reader. Yeah, the the book is about, as you know, two different families that have fallen on very difficult circumstances, and their circumstances are different. So one family is dealing with a tragic loss, and another family is dealing with addiction and the absence of a father figure. And so for both of these families, I wanted to show the brutality and loneliness and difficulty of what they're going through, but also shed light on the ways that they find to get through and hold on to some sliver or sense of hope. Um, And it's different things for each family. For one family, it's achievement 
and getting opportunity by going to a better high school. Um, for the other family, it's actually similar. It's hoping to find a better life through some kind of class mobility. But the children in the family have their own ways of coping. Um, and part of that has to do with the school play that children from each of the families end up joining. Do you do you kind of test yourself, though, in the conception of how these these lives of these individual families are going to play out? And do you sit, do you think I can give them this and I can give them this kind of conflict and I can give them this difficult challenge to solve? And then I feel like I have laid a lot on their shoulders to resolve. Or is this is this kind of more instinctive and when it's right, it feels right in the conception of it? I don't think about a limit to really? the burdens of my characters, actually. In <laughs> part, um, I think because, you know, in sort of my own family history, there is a lot of trauma and intergenerational trauma, and it doesn't always feel like the universe sort of has a limit in that heaping on of difficulty. But instead of thinking about lessening burdens, I do think about what else there is in a life. Like, what are the points of relief? What are the ways that the different characters have agency and a way to make their own lives better, even if it's not that difficult things stop coming their way? You know, when you when you talk about trauma, I think about the the field of epigenetics and how trauma folds in and continues through generations. And you give us a sense of that without being heavy handed about it. We do have this sense that the traumatic um, elements that these characters are wrestling with are going to be their children's to carry to. Do, do I have that? How are you thinking about that? I think you're exactly right. I was thinking a lot about what gets passed down, what are different mm -hmm. family legacies, um, whether that's pain or whether that's a narrative of what people in a certain family do. Um, and I was thinking about what changes from generation to generation. There are things that persist and the children who are at the beginning of this novel and are adults at the end certainly are still carrying the burdens of their pasts. But I think that many of them are also living in ways that they couldn't have imagined as children and that go beyond their wildest dreams, although their wounds are still with them. Yeah. Um, there is a there is kind of a dawning and a realization. This happens probably in every in every child's life where you move away from being just the child of the parent and you begin to see the parent in a more adult objective way, not fully objective ever, but in some kind of objectivity. And you begin to understand that as different as you've pronounced that you will be, you are your parents' child, right? H have you had that kind of realization? I certainly have. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we absorb so much from our parents, um, our caregivers, without realizing it. I have a small child, and I'm often narrating the world and life to her. And I think about the power of that in the way I construct the narrative of our morning or her day. Um, and in the book, you know, the two children that I focus on from these two families, Noel and G, they certainly have lots of issues with their mothers um, and anger at the ways that they were mothered, but they certainly carry things with them into their adulthood that are fashioned after their mothers. So for G, that's sort of repressing deep emotion and having an emphasis on always moving forward. And then for Noel, it's some stubbornness and self-righteousness. Um, it's interesting to hear you say that you narrate the day to your daughter. How old is your daughter? You're a fairly new mother, right? Yes. She's a toddler. So she's still under, she's under two. Okay. Because I think often about the story that our families tell us early on about who we are as a family. And this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, which that story, that narrative is, boy, it's a mix of 
your own childhood, the world around you, how you see yourself in the world, how you see your family in the world. And then you layer on top of this a professional storyteller like yourself. How often do you kind of tune in to think, I'm setting a narrative, I'm telling her the story of who we are, and this is what this is what it'll be. I mean, do you think about that? I think about it quite a lot. Um, and I think that part of it is because I believe that words and language are powerful. I think that the way we think about ourselves and others determines the shape of our lives. Um, it's something that I try to render in my books, sort of the way my characters misperceive one another and misperceive themselves has serious consequences. And also when they're able to really see and understand one another, there's intimacy and connection. So I think about it a lot, perhaps more than is necessary during breakfast um, <laughs> or, or a trip to the playground. And, you know, maybe that'll be one of the things that my daughter tells me one day uh, wasn't helpful or useful, but I'm sticking to it for now. That sort of mindfulness of what I'm teaching her about herself and the world based on how I describe it to her. And, and what the world is saying back to you, right? About who you are and who your family is. And can you trust, I mean, you've just kind of said this, that the misperceptions that the characters feel, like, can you trust your own interpretation of what you think the world is saying to you? Yeah? Tease that out a little bit. Uh, yeah. Well, one of the things that I, I love about the form of the novel is that it can raise so many good questions that make us reconsider ideas that we're moving with, we're carrying with us into the world without really examination. So, you know, the character Lacey May in the novel who opposes the integration has ideas of her own about what she deserves and how she got what she has and what her daughters deserve and what other people in her community don't deserve. And those questions are largely um, unchallenged by her. Some of the people in her life begin to challenge her on those ideas. Her daughter, Noelle, tries to hold her accountable. Um, but I think that it's quite difficult to see beyond our own perspectives. We're all sort of stuck in our own minds. And one of the gifts of a novel is that we have access to the minds of others in a way that we don't in everyday life. Yeah. I mean, this, I, I think we're we're living out the reality right now and have been for a while of what you're describing, right? How we think we are seen, let's say through the lens of our neighbors and our communities and then our political uh, colleagues, right? We, th we sort ourselves into places where we think our political views are shared by people, and then you learn that somebody sees your inclusion into that group very differently than you see the right of your inclusion in that group. You get at this so subtly in this. The vehicle for, we should say for, for listeners who haven't read the novel yet, the vehicle for this, for so much of the complexity of this, is this... Um, decision by this school that they will integrate and how the maybe maybe you better describe this give give us a little scene setter of kind of the conflict that's at the center around this school yes so there are two mothers that the book focuses on and their children there's a white woman named Lacey May and she has three daughters and her family is struggling with addiction her husband Robbie is in and out of town um, and really suffering and having a hard time and unable to support the family and over on the east side of town there is a black woman named Jade who's the mother to a son named G who has lost too much and seen too much um, for his his age. And they're also trying to figure out how to recover their lives after a tragic loss. And when a local high school decides to 
integrate and bring children from the east side of town, the largely black east side of town, into the west side of town, the fates of the two families collide. And the thinking behind the initiative is that it's one that's going to create economic diversity. The policy mm. is based on including students who are on free or reduced school lunch, but it's effectively an integration also across lines of class. Um, and so it brings these families together in the school and causes quite a lot of uproar um, and struggle over which children deserve what kind of education um, and brings up all kinds of sticky arguments about merit and what it means to deserve opportunity and a better life. Um, and then there are, there are the feuding parents and then there are the children who have to find a place for themselves in this school. Perfect. Wow. Um, <laughs> that whole ball of complicated uh, conflicts there. So well described. Um, oh, thanks. And so, so let's come back to on paper, if you saw the lives, the descriptions, the achievements of some of these characters, you would think you'd understand how they would come to this conflict over integration. But what you've done is say, you know, these people are much more complicated than just, right, the, the arc of their lives on paper. And they come to this with the complexity of these feelings. And I think you're also getting at something that we see again play out in, you know, where we send our kids to school, right? Who, where we worship on Sunday mornings. A lot of the decisions that we think we're making in a given week that seem individual, and yet they have these really deep tentacles with other perceptions and other ways we see ourselves. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I hear often from others and that I say myself now that I'm a parent is that I have to do what's best for my kids. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's such value and beauty in a statement like that in terms of what it means that many parents will do for their kids. But it, there's also an underside to it in terms of the the ills and the harms that will sort of stand by or defend. Um, it's kind of an unimpeachable statement or sentiment. I have to do what's best for my kids. <laughs> and it can be used to sort of justify um, leading a largely segregated life um, and uh, living in a segregated neighborhood or resisting an integration right. initiative um, and really valuing one's own family and well-being um, at the expense of others. And who can blame you for that? I mean, just as you said, it's an unimpeachable sentiment. Who would argue with, I'm just trying to do what's right for my kids? Yeah, and I think that that's, you know, partially one of the reasons that it's the argument that gets made. I think there's truth to it, and I think it's also sort of a brilliant strategy. Um, and um, what do you, yeah, what do you like mean a by more that? I mean, I think it's a more effective statement than saying, I'm scared yeah. of those kids, or I really do want my kids to be at the top, um, because that's sort of one of my roles as a parent, making sure that my kids go further and go to the top. Of course, not all people think that way, but I don't think it's an uncommon feeling or thought, even if it doesn't get said aloud. You know, this is reminding me, and you probably, maybe you read the series in preparation for the novel that the Nicole Hannah Jones pieces yes. about, <laughs> yes. about making decisions just like this. So this was part of your, this is kind of a subtext for the way you saw this yes. play out in the novel. Yes, I've been very inspired and influenced by her work and also convicted and find it, you know, the things that she's calling for urgent and really challenging, really encouraging us to see our fates as bound up together um, and asking ourselves, you know, what, what am I willing to work toward or give up? I feel that so much of our culture can be geared towards maximizing outcomes, yeah, you know, like yeah. what can we do for our health, our education, the best um, for ourselves and for our loved ones. And so I find the work of Nicole Hannah-Jones 
really challenging, especially since, you know, in my own life, I benefited from a, a program that took high achieving students of color from public schools into private schools. Um, and I was one of those kids and it changed the trajectory of my life. And it was an instance where, you know, my family had the opportunity to give me a leg up. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, it has a lot to do with me becoming a writer, just all of the books I read and my English classes and the high caliber of them. And so it's something that I think is really sticky and complicated, but worth getting into. So I am so curious about whether you remember hearing your parents talk about what it was going to mean to take you out of whatever public school, right, was in your neighborhood. Did you grow up in Brooklyn? I did. Okay. So whatever public school was near you that you would have traditionally gone to and what they knew it might be like, the opportunity, maybe some of the hardship, right, of going to this private school. Do you remember hearing them talk about that? I do. And I remember hearing sort of larger conversations in the extended family as well. I think that there was some divided opinion, like some people who thought that it was too good of an opportunity to pass up on because of what it would give to me in terms of opportunity. And then there were other people who thought that it might lead to me changing in a way and becoming really different from my family. And I think that they were both right. Like that they were happened. both true. That happened. Yeah. I think that um, it's one of the reasons that in my work, I think so much about um, sort of relationships or contexts across lines of difference, whether that's a gentrifying neighborhood in my first novel or this integrating school in what's mine and yours is in part because I had an experience of being one of a few people of color in my private high school and then later on when I went on to college. And so all of the scrutiny and pressure of that position, but also the opportunity that it opened up is something that I think I'm still thinking through in my work mm -hmm. through the fiction. Do you remember coming home from that private school, maybe maybe in high school, and seeing maybe your parents or the neighborhood or the friends that you'd known since you were a little kid in the neighborhood differently? Yeah, I think that I felt, you know, sort of, something that I know is not uncommon, but was still difficult, which is feeling a part of multiple worlds and then also on the outside of multiple worlds at the same time. So sort of like one foot in, one foot out in the world of home, one foot in, one foot out in the world of school. And that having to do with race and class and education um, and culture in all of these ways. And so I think that one of the things I'm writing about and what's mine and yours is all the different ways that the characters feel they belong and don't belong at school or in their city or in their own kind of families and the, the alienation of that position. One of the things that I remember about the Nicole Hannah Jones writings on making her own decision on where to put her children into schools was a question she asks, which is, if we have this opportunity for a better education for my child, and I hear people saying, but you're betraying the, the public school, the, what we're trying to achieve, if everybody leaves, that will do nothing for the quality of the public school that you're leaving. And I remember her asking in a way, why do we have to be the ones to make the sacrifice, right? Like, mm. I don't, I can't, I can't come to terms with the idea of sacrificing my child for that better goal, which is absolutely a laudable goal, right? Yeah, I think that one of the questions that I took away from her her work and from that essay that she wrote for the New York Times about choosing a school in a segregated system for her daughter was this question of like what is the actual sacrifice and what is being given up right. um, and it's different for different families you know so um, for instance I you know my daughter's not school age um, but 
for her to attend the public school that I attended might mean something different for her than it did for me because she is so well-resourced and has so many privileges that I didn't have when mm -hmm. I was her age. Um, and I think that that's something that gets um, sticky in this conversation that um, families that are really well-resourced and have a lot of the indicators that let us know that the kids are gonna do fine um, in adulthood, um, perhaps think that they're giving up more than they actually are, say, in yeah. keeping, their keeping their child in the private school. There might be something um, that the child doesn't get, you know, like a, like a rock star arts program, and that's valuable. But whether it means that that child um, is going to experience downward mobility, mm. especially if they're, they come from an affluent family, a white family, um, it doesn't mean that. So do you think you're a different person for having gone to that private school? Absolutely. I mean, I think that I think that our experiences form us. So wherever I went to high school would have would have shaped who I am. But but certainly I think having that um, sort of insight into such a different world and experience um, inside the city that I grew up in. It's a totally different New York. Sort of this high school's on the on the Upper East Side and I grew up in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. So it's a window into an entirely different world. And so I think that I'm interested in showing that and how sort of diverse cities that are lauded for their diversity um, can contain quite separate pockets that rarely overlap or when they overlap, it's complicated. Um, and I think that's true of the unnamed city and what's mine and yours. And it's certainly true of New York. Yeah, I did notice that it was unnamed. It's in the North Carolina Piedmont. Yes. But unnamed. And why? Well, I think that it was because I wanted to set the book sort of in that region of the Piedmont because it's the one I was most familiar with. I lived in North Carolina for a number of years. I loved sort of the landscape of the Piedmont and wanted to be able to write about the land. And it's also home to many of the major cities in North Carolina. I wanted to leave it open so that I could sort of play around with the integration plot because mm -hmm. the the history of integration and public schools in North Carolina really varies from city to city. And so I kind of wanted to give myself some room there. Um, and that's sort of why it's why it's unnamed. But I was thinking heavily about Durham and the city of Durham, which is where I lived. And then for the integration initiative, I was thinking a lot about the city of Raleigh um, oh. and Wake County. Okay, I thought you were going to say Charlotte, because I know the Charlotte Mecklenburg School District went through, I think, a big court case, right, about integration. So each, this is interesting, so each city in this state that you're in this area that you're really familiar with has wrestled with this maybe in different ways. Yeah. My, you know, my, I, when I came up with the integration plot, I was sort of thinking about, I was pulling from lots of different places. So I was pulling from some of the reporting that Nicole Hannah Jones did for this American life about a school district in Missouri in the Normandy school district. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about what I knew of Wake County integration um, initiative in the early 2000s. And then I was also just thinking more broadly about how these issues play out in a range of ways in the United States. Um, after finishing the book, I found the podcast Nice White Parents oh, yes. from the New York Times, yeah. um, which I thought was wonderful. <laughs> and I thought resonated so much with the book, but is set in in Brooklyn. Right. And so, you know, the, the story is a North Carolina story, but I don't think that that's because of the integration plot line. Um, I think that, you know, similar events could play out um, in a number of places and certainly do across the country. I think this might be a good moment for the excerpt because we're talking a lot about the, the complications that they're wrestling with in this scene. Maybe you'll tell us a little bit about what's happening before you read the excerpt in, in the story. Yes, I'm happy to. So this excerpt is from a point in the novel where the children in the two families are adolescents, they're high school age. We meet them when they're much younger earlier on. And there's a meeting that's meant to just bring together 
old students and their families and new students and their family for one high school, Central High School, that is going to be bringing in students as part of this county initiative for integration, merging the city and the county school systems. And we're with Jade and her son G for most of this section um, where they arrive and they're listening to the different parents making statements about how they feel about the integration. And I'll, I'll pick up with Jade and G listening to some of the speeches. A meek mannered woman with a short black bob and glasses edged to the microphone as if it caused her great pain to do so. She began in a low voice. Everybody deserves a fair shot in life. I believe that. I always have. That's what America is about. My son is applying for college this year, and I've heard it on good authority that this wasn't random, that these kids were handpicked because they're star students, and now my kid's ranking is going to fall. What has my son been working for if these new students are going to come in underneath his nose and steal everything he's been working for and everything we've all been working for? Everything we do is for him. I know this isn't about integration. It isn't about what's right. They put nice words in the pamphlets, but I'm not fooled. This is about money, 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 and the city being greedy. They're playing around with my kid's future. Central might not hit that county quota of no more than 40% of students on free or reduced lunch because we may leave. A lot of us may leave. I'm looking into private school for my girls because I can't trust the administration here and I can no longer trust the city I've lived in and that my family has lived in for generations, for over 100 years. G felt Lynette stir beside him. Her leg thumped underneath her and she nodded her hands in her lap. She was nervous and it was catching. He leaned away from her in his seat. Jade reached over to take Lynette's hand and steady her. The women locked fingers. Jade was swinging her head from side to side, disagreeing with the latest speaker at the podium. She knew it was only a matter of time before she burst. Next, there was a man in a plaid shirt, a long beard and sideburns. He pointed at the floor for emphasis with every sentence. He was so steady, so even, it was terrifying. Am I the only one who will say it? These kids could be bad kids. What about background checks? How are you going to keep our kids safe? Are we going to put in metal detectors? What about in the hallway when my daughter's walking between her classes? And what about the parking lot? We ought to put cameras out there. G felt his vision tunnel. The room around him turn black at the edges. He made forehead with his sleeve. He was turning inward, closing up. He nearly missed Adira sliding to the microphone, her hands clasped primly in front of her, her head high. My name is Adira Howard, and I'll be a junior here at Central next fall. I came tonight because I was excited, because I want a future too. G wondered at Adira. She was stupid and brave and beautiful all at once. My family has been here for generations too, and I deserve my future as much as anybody else. It hurts to know I'm not welcome here, at a school that's only 15 minutes away from my house, all because of the color of my skin. There was an encouraging whistle from the front row, and the Howards stood up, clapping for their girl. A few white grown-ups stood, too, to applaud Adira, and she wondered why they hadn't spoken yet. Where were all the people who had published op-eds in the paper about the benefits of the program? Where was that majority who supported this change? Perfect. I think I'll stop there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Naima Coster with her new novel, What's Mine and Yours. I'm Carrie Miller, and you're listening to a digital talking volumes. Um, there's so much to follow up there. Uh, I haven't even talked to you yet about how you think about women in power. There are daughters. Uh, I, I get the sense that you're quite interested in that dynamic between mothers and daughters. It shows up in, and fathers and daughters, it shows up in Halsey Street, your previous novel, and boy, does it show up here. I, I, you know, these individual characters have these different, obviously, dynamics with their mother in, in this, in Lacey May's family. They are individual, and yet they are universal, I recognized so much of the, you know, and I'm nothing like the the daughters that 
are in this. That that's the mark of a of a really great novel. But I'd like to know how you think about these individual relationships that these daughters had with their mothers, but then this sense of universality. A daughter mm-hmm. as you are a daughter yourself. Yes. Well, I'm fascinated with who mothers are, who they were before becoming mothers and how <laughs> they they carry that part of themselves into the work and role of mothering. Um, so, you know, in what's mine and yours, I think that there is this tension between the, the two mothers who the book focuses on, Jade and Lacey May, pursuing what they want for themselves, whether that's with romantic love or with career ambitions or just wanting space for themselves. Um, And then all of the things that they want to provide for their children and sort of the tension between that, the tension between caring for someone else and also finding ways to take care of yourself and look after your own dreams and life. Um, And I think that, you know, for Jade in particular, whose son sees her as hard and unfeeling. Um, I was really interested in showing how she can be sort of uncompromising in taking things for herself. Mm -hmm. Um, And that causes her son pain and distress. She's not particularly warm with him. But, you know, as her creator, I envisioned her as someone who does love her son and is able to show it in some ways. She's able to show it in the ways that she tries to protect him in a way that she wasn't protected um, in the ways that she tries to prepare him for the world. Since he's sensitive, anxious, he's a young black man who's lost so much and is in this hostile environment. And so I'm really fascinated in what parents who love their children and are trying to do their best are able to pull off. Um, (laughs) and And then what they're not and how that's reckoned with over the years. The other thing that occurred to me about the other family, Lacey May and her daughters, she's making and made sacrifices for them, big sacrifices. And yet she never says to them, as probably some mothers do, look at the sacrifices. I mean, she, I think she has this sense of wanting the work to show for itself And these daughters understand that in varying or misunderstand that in varying degrees. Is that a fair way to to put it, do you think? I think that it is fair. Um, And, you know, one of the things that I try to explore um, in the book are the big emotions that come up from family conflict and loss and the ways that people struggle to figure out where to put those emotions, you know? So the, the, the three Ventura girls take out their frustrations on each other. Right. That have to do with what's happened with their parents. And Lacey May, I think in some moments takes out her frustrations with her absent husband, Robbie with the children at the, at the school that's being integrated. And so I think that that's something that's fascinating to write about because when it's happening to us in our lives, I think we can so rarely, notice unless we have, you know, a good friend or a therapist or some sort of mindfulness practice to (laughs) to see what's happening in our own lives. Yeah. I mean, do you think it is, I'm not a mother, so I'm going to ask this of somebody who's at the beginning of, right, this experience of motherhood, but who has been a daughter, both of us. Do, Do you think it is the hope of every mother that eventually their children recognize, not that you don't know the sacrifices that I made, but that there were compromises, and that is human and natural. And you too will come into a world of having to make compromises. You know, that parents understand that part of becoming an adult is is putting those compromises that were made in the right context. How how do you think how do you think you'll think about that? How do you think about that as as a daughter whose parents I'm sure made some compromises for you? Yeah, well, you know, something that I think a lot about now that I'm a parent is accountability. Um and hmm. my my hope 
that I will be open to being held accountable by my daughter one day. <laughs> Easy to really? say now. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And I and I think that I, I'm interested in that um, because I do think a lot about um, how a parent-child relationship, certainly when a child is young, is quite different from other relationships where there can be more reciprocity and mutuality. You know, I don't need to have a reciprocal mutual relationship with my daughter right now. Um, And so I do think that there's sort of a special obligation that, that parents have um, to, to care for their child, to regulate themselves emotionally. And it's not always possible. Um, certainly it's not possible now for many families in this extremely stressful yeah. time of the pandemic. And so, you know, in the book, I'm writing about parents who have had really hard lives and, um, and part of what I hope the book accomplishes is it it helps their choices seem comprehensible. Like we mm-hmm. can understand mm-hmm. perhaps um, why Jade is the way she is and Lacey May is the way she is and why Robbie is the way he is. But it doesn't change that there is some sort of reckoning with that or accountability and that that's a part of love, sort of the adult children coming back to their parents and in some way articulating, you know, what they lost or what they missed and the parents being able to hear and receive that. And I'll say that that's probably some wish fulfillment. I was going to say, my oh my yeah. gosh, that sounds, <laughs> yeah. that sounds dangerous to me in some ways, because, you know, to that conversation with a parent where you are lovingly holding them accountable is still painful, painful but mm-hmm. for the for the child and the parent too. I can't mm-hmm. imagine volunteering for that as as a mother. I don't I don't know. Yeah, well, you know, always easier said than done. And as I said, my daughter is only two, but I do I think a lot about what it actually means to be close. Like, what does it mm-hmm. mean to be close to a partner, a sibling, mm-hmm. a child, a parent, a spouse? And I think that a part of that is is honesty, not, not cruelty, right? That not sort of like, but, um, but honesty, um, and being able to, to sit with hardship or with hurt, or even just with difference, like ways that you might be different from someone. Um, and so I think that's one of my, my values in many of my relationships and, We'll see how it goes. (laughs) (laughs) You'll get back to me on that in 20 years, right? She'll be 22. Um, Yeah. You know, I was still working through a lot of the relationships that Britt Bennett's novel, The Vanishing Half. Have you had a chance to read it yet? I have, and I loved it. Okay. So you know what I mean when I say, again, mother's and daughters and accountability and how painful that can be if the parent isn't ready for it, but the children are are holding the parent accountable. And this seemed, you know, having come out of reading that novel and still thinking a lot about the, the patterns of those relationships, and then in comes your novel with kind of a new take on this idea of what it is to be a family and what it is to be a parent. Do you have a sense that maybe the two novels, I don't know, unintentionally, of course, are have something to say to each other? Well, I love that idea because I love Britt Bennett's work and I loved The Vanishing Half. You know, one thing that I thought was so brilliant about that novel is that the accountability in it isn't punishment, um, which I think is great and related to what I'm thinking through here, that holding someone accountable is different than condemning them. Um, And I think that that's why there's a place for that, that sort of reckoning in in loving relationship, in community. Um, You know, there's the sister who passes in that novel. And while the novel explores the losses that that creates and the consequences of that, she isn't ultimately punished or condemned. Um, There's just sort of honesty about the consequences and legacy of that experience. And I thought that that was wonderful and something I'm really interested in as a writer, sort of showing the consequences of people's choices. But it doesn't mean that they're thrown out 
or or punished or or labeled as bad or unlikable. Mm -hmm. No, I love the idea of that, that it isn't society rendering some kind of judgment on you and then you having to live with that judgment. It is gradually, quietly coming to terms with the consequences of having made a pretty transformational decision like that. And yes. then, and and probably that's probably even the more, I mean, we're used to talking about cancel culture and shaming, but the much more difficult consequence of that, right, is realizing that you made a decision that is life changing. And did you make it for all the right reasons? And then living with having to answer those questions. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then I think, you know, something I love books that sort of end on a, a precipice and you can sense that there's <laughs> so much life beyond the end of the page. <laughs> right, um, right. I think The Vanishing Half is is like that. I'd like to think that my book is like that. For and the sure. question is, well, you know, well, well, where do we go now? Like how after we've had this reckoning or there's been this accountability, how do we move forward and figure out a way to live together. And I think that that's true of the children who come home at the end of, and at the end of my book, sort of whatever their parents have done, whatever has happened over the course of the book doesn't sever the relationship. It shapes it, but it doesn't sort of end their story. You know, without, without saying, and then I'm going to write a sequel about that. Do you, <laughs> which I'm sure you're not going to do, but do you try to answer some of those questions that will, you know, what what could be pushing beyond the last page of this novel so that I understand why I am bringing it to the kind of conclusion that I am? Mm -hmm. I think that I try to suggest what what is ahead for the character sort of internally or emotionally. So mm -hmm. I don't think that I suggest a lot about future events, yeah, you know, um, whether people will get back together or, you know, whether will where they'll live or where they'll move, um, whether people will be able to manage their illnesses. Right. Um, but I, but I do try to suggest something about what has changed in their hearts or in their minds, like what has changed about the way they see the people closest to them and they, and the way they see themselves because of the journey of the book. Yeah, that makes and, – and then that's information that will influence the way the book concludes, but that the reader doesn't need and maybe shouldn't ask for. <laughs> I don't know. How many of your readers come up and say, but I wanted to know what happened after you ended Halsey Street? Because, again, those characters were fascinating to live with. You know, I have heard that from some readers, and <laughs> I you? have asked if I if I would write a sequel, and I don't have plans to write a sequel to either that book or or this one. Right. But I do think you know it's a way that we move through our lives too, where we don't know what's going to happen next. We just have a sense of where we're at and our consciousness in the moment. And I can understand why people will turn to a book and hope that it can give them some some clarity or path forward that maybe we don't get day to day in our lives. Okay, I have some booky questions for you because you're sitting in front yes. of a bookshelf. Yes. And of course you were a big reader as a young woman yes. as you went into, you know, your education. It, it tell me some of the books that really early on gave you that sense that that books contain worlds. And they can take you far beyond, you know, the, the neighborhood, the school. You know, I, I kind of remember the moment that I realized that. Do you? Hmm. I remember when I read a book that made me want to pursue writing more seriously. Hmm. Um, so What was uh, it? It was Breath Eyes Memory by Edwige Danticat. Oh, my gosh. Um, which is, yes. Yeah. So a, a mother-daughter story right. um, with pieces in, in Haiti and pieces in Brooklyn. 
And it was a story of this intimate relationship, but also the story of a place um, and of a history. And I, I wrote before that. I wrote from girlhood. I have composition notebooks sort of filled with novels mimicking what I was reading. So, you know, <laughs> Good books practice. set on, yeah, books set on deserted islands and, you know, <laughs> books, books set in the suburbs and all kinds of environments, unlike the one that I was growing up in. Um, but that was a book that I loved and read as a young woman that felt so real to me. Mm -hmm. It had all the pleasures of fiction, but also resonated with so much of my experience and themes that are interesting to me. And so that was the book where I thought, maybe, I, maybe I'll write something like this one day. Um, yeah. Although it certainly wasn't the first book that I adored. I really loved Danny, the champion of the world by Roald Dahl, which is a father son story. Nice. Um, and I love dear Mr. Henshaw by Beverly Cleary when I was very young, which is a mother son story. Um, so always gravitated to sort of family, family stories and, and difficult family stories. I think dear Mr. Henshaw and Danny, the champion of the world feature families, you know, living in really complicated contexts. So, um, the bookshelf behind you, this is kind of, this is what's fun about doing these interviews like this. Is this your family bookshelf or is this your personal bookshelf? Or tell me a little bit about the books behind you. This is, this is my bookshelf. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, we have bookshelves throughout the apartment, but I'm in my office, um, which is great. I'm very happy to have one and to have a door that I can sort of clothes. Um, great. Yeah. And so these, these are my books. They include books that have some of my work anthologized in them. There's an anthology of women writing about home called This is the Place that I have on my shelf um, that well, what else includes it, my work. And then work work that I've read recently that I've really loved. I can pull some things okay, off. I do. I, um, I would love to have you do yeah. that. Here are some good ones that I have read recently that I really loved. Um, we can start with maybe, oh, these three, they're really great. Okay. Um, <laughs> you tell me if three is too many. No, that's great. Um, yeah. So this close to okay by Lisa Cross Smith was just released in February. Um, it's a novel. It's about a woman named Tally who sees a man named Emmett about to jump off a bridge. Um, and, uh, He's had a tough time. He's suicidal. And Tally talks him down. And she's a therapist, so she has some training. She hides the fact that she's a therapist from him. And then they spend a few days together sort of talking about their lives. Um, there's, it's a book, I think, about the power of conversation and also about secrets. Um, they keep lots of secrets from each other, even as they disclose lots of things. Um, and it was Boy, just sounds good. terrific. Yeah. It's really good. It's really wonderful. Um, this book, Cantoras, is probably my favorite book that oh I read gosh. in 2020. I finished that, uh, what, I guess at the beginning of last year. So, what did you think of so it? So different. It, it went, I mean, this un the description of the island that they go to was magical every time they went back to it. The description yes. changed uh, and was all encompassing. I loved it. And I just found it because somebody it at a too. bookstore handed it to me. How did you find it? I, I did an event with Carolina de Robertis before I read it. And I loved hearing her speak about the book. And so I went and I got it and it reminded me of why I love novels. You know, it has like a, <laughs> yeah. it's like expansive and covers lots of different years and it has so many different characters that it's able to get close to. Um, it was sort of intimate and deep, but then also just so broad and expansive. And it was wonderful. I loved and it so much. It takes place in South America and I want to read more literature from South America taking place in South America. I mean, I've read every everything yeah. Isabel Allende has written. So more, more, more. <laughs> yes. Good. Have you read Infinite? My, my shelf is very useful. Have you read Infinite Country by Patricia Engel? I know that's just coming out, right? Is that it's coming advanced, out? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. An advanced reader copy. It's set in Colombia. It's wonderful. Great. I really loved it. Um, 
It's about a family divided by deportation, um, a Colombian American family and their journey back to each other. So really, really good. Excellent. Um, and then the last book that I pulled from the shelf is Milk Blood Heat, which is a recent collection of short stories by a debut writer, Dantiel Moniz. Um, oh. And the short stories are all about girlhood and womanhood and some of the elements of the female experience that are perhaps less uh, publicly acceptable to talk about. Oh, so a lot really? of a lot of desire and rage and bodies um, and the female body. And they're just really wonderful. They're really, really good. Sounds brave. Yeah, it is. Right? I think it yeah. is. And fierce. One last question about books. Um, is there a book on your shelf that, you know, in the midst of the isolation of the pandemic and, you know, this has been hard. I mean, we're coming up on a year now of basically locked down in isolation and isolation and a lot of solitary time. Is there a book that you turn back to, maybe pull off the shelf and say, I'm feeling pretty blue today. This is going to make the difference because it always has. Yeah. You know, there is a book like that for me, but I haven't pulled it off the shelf during the pandemic. So maybe I should, <laughs> maybe that's, <laughs> you know, you're reminding me that might be a good idea. Um, I love Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora oh, Neale Hurston. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, yes. it's it's probably my favorite book of all time. I've read There's, it. It's probably the book I've read the most, the reread the most times. There's a lot of trauma um, in that. Uh, tell me what's comforting is, about that book to you. Is, well, you know, we were talking about books that kind of like end on a precipice. And yeah. I love that the end of that book of so much trauma and loss, there is this gesture that Janie has her whole life ahead of her and that she has all of the wisdom and strength from those experiences with her at the end. And she has a friend. She's a very good friend yes. who's listening to her there at the end. And so it's not a bleak story in any way. Um, and I do find comfort to go back to our conversation about, you know, whether or not what's mine and yours is a bomb. I do find <laughs> comfort in books that render difficulty and loss, but make sure to remind us of what the characters still have and what right. they've still been able to pick up and accumulate along the way. And sometimes that is a friend who's sitting with you on the porch or, you know, for Janie, it's also the sense that she was deeply loved um, and that that's something she can carry with her. Um, it's not just sort of the loss. I mean, what I felt Zora Neale Hurston did in that novel was she didn't, she doesn't release the reader into the depths of the trauma and the loss alone. I mean, she, she does this magnificent job of kind of carrying us through the worst of it with, as you're saying, with that sense that, but there is light on the other side of that. I don't know how, I, I don't know how intentional that was, but boy, the magnificence of that novel. And you can read yeah. it again and again. How many times have you read it? You probably see different things in it every time. I'm not sure. If I had to ballpark, I'd say maybe six times, six wow. or seven times. Yeah. Yeah, this might be the right moment for that, Naima. <laughs> yeah, I might, I, might, I might need it. We're, you know, all, we're, really. we're in a flood. <laughs> yeah. Hey, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for having me and for all your thoughtful questions. I really, I look forward to reading whatever is coming next and we'll do it again. Okay. Sounds good. I'll be here. All right. All right. Hello. Welcome to the second part of Talking Volumes. My name is Lori Herzl. I'm the books editor at the Minneapolis Star Tribune. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Naomi is, is no longer here. That was a pre-recorded um, session, but now I am here with Angela Ajahi. And um, we're here to have sort of the book club part of the evening. And I hope you will um, send us questions and take part in that way. Um, Angela, I need her little bio here so you're familiar. Um, I know her first of all as one of my absolute most trusted book critics. 
but she's also um, a writer and an editor. Her first story, uh, Galena, was published in Fifth Wednesday Journal and it won the 2017 Penn Robert J. Dow Short Story Prize for Emerging Writers. Her essays, book reviews, and author interviews have appeared in The Common Online, Wild River Review, and of course, the Minneapolis Star Tribune. A former book editor, she teaches writing at the, Liter at the Loft Literary Center. She has a bachelor's degree in English literature from Calvin College and a master's in comparative literature from Columbia University. In her fiction, she often seeks to explore the intersection of race, gender, and class in cross-cultural spaces. She has a short story forthcoming in Pleiades and is writing her first book, a collection of linked stories. It's so nice to see you, Angela. Thank you, Lori. It's great to be here. And you are the perfect person to chat with after that great conversation between Carrie Miller and Naima Custer. Um, her book, I thought, was just fascinating. The conversation was ebullient. It was great. Um, so I hope that the audience will take part and give questions to us. We can't answer questions about, um, you know, what Naima thinks, obviously, but we can uh, make this into a little book club conversation. Um, I thought that we could start by just sort of giving our general impressions of her novel. Um, I know that when I started reading it, the first chapter was so powerful. Um, the character of Ray, the uh, stepfather of G, was such a great guy and he had this wonderful bakery and, and life was just like going great and I knew something terrible was going to happen. This is not a spoiler if you haven't read the book yet. Um, because this is all just sort of the setup to the rest of the novel, but um, it was it was just such a tragic beginning. And I closed that first chapter, and I thought I can't I can't read this book. <laughs> but as the story unfolds, it is not a tragedy. It is really um, kind of a generational saga of two families. And um, what were your thoughts? Angela. Yeah, no, I, I think that I, I had a similar reaction at the beginning, you know, sort of coming up against this tragedy right off the bat and, and thinking, you know, where is she going to go from here as a writer? Um, but she does such a wonderful job of sort of sort of introducing character after character and building the story of a family or two families mm -hmm. um, whose lives end up sort of intersecting, right, at some point down the line. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, you know, it, I, I think going back to her interview where she talks about this idea of the intergenerational trauma, I think that's something she begins with, right? And she really kind of runs with it and makes the story, it you know, just grows the story from that in a way that I think is, is really interesting and wonderful. So she has these two families, um, Jade, who is a single mother, a black woman, and she is G's mother, she's a nurse. And um, I mean, she's trying to deal with the loss of Ray who dies in the first chapter, and she's trying to protect her son from um, the difficulties of, of life, but she's also trying to kind of keep it together because she's going to nursing school and she's, she's trying to um, do everything. She's, she's very strong. She kind of stuffs her feelings, which then kind of affects the way that G grows up, right? You, you know, you're affected by your parents. And then you have the other family, uh, Lacey May, and she has a husband who is, um, addicted. And so he's in and out of the picture. She's really trying to make it work herself as well. And they have three daughters who are mixed race because Lacey May is white and her husband is Colombian, I believe. And one of the other, um, th there were so many interesting themes in this book. They're just really fodder for, uh, for thought. But one of them was um, the racism in the book, which was not, I mean, I think there is there is a concept that if someone is racist, they are racist against everyone who is not like them. But but this book really, one of the themes is anti-black racism. It is not 
it is not a comprehensive thing. There's 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 specific things that, like Lacey May is um, opposed to the desegregation of the school where her children go and her children are mixed race. So that seemed to me to be a really, really interesting um, theme of the book. Yeah, and it's interesting with Lacey May, you know, she's a white woman. Um, she marries a man who is not white. He's in fact Colombian, a, a mm -hmm. brown person, uh, you know. And um, so it's interesting too uh, that uh, Coster um, makes her into a racist person because she actually married someone who is, you know, not, you know, the same color that she is. So, yeah, I think there are these interesting dynamics um, in, in their relationship specifically, Lacey May and Robbie's, and it, it kind of ends up sort of moving into the lives of their children, their daughters, um, where they begin to have to negotiate, you know, um, you know, their identities, um, because I think that they are three very different looking daughters, right? right. And, and mm -hmm. so they have to negotiate, um, you know, their cultural identity, their racial identity throughout the entire novel. And um, I, I thought that was an interesting kind of aspect of the story. Um, and um, so, yeah, so I, I think we talked about Noel being a white, um, white presenting, um, that's the term that no, uh, Coster uses. The middle daughter, uh, Margarita, I think is sort of ethnically ambiguous. That's also mm -hmm. a term that um, uh, Coster uses. And I think uh, Diane is, is brown, brown skin. She's, you know, very, looks very much like a person of color. So I, you know, so yeah, we, we've talked about this. I, you know, we've talked about this, this, you know, situation that she has put these um, these daughters in. And I think part of the experience of reading the novel is seeing how they kind of make their way in the world um, with these sorts of, you know, identity, identity issues, I guess, to some extent, so. Yeah, I mean, that to me was fascinating that all three sisters, uh, they, it, she says several times throughout the novel that they, they are very beautiful. They, they, they look like sisters, um, but they are all very different. Um, Noelle passes as white, but she doesn't feel white. She's the one who identifies the most with their um, Latinx heritage. And then, like you said, the other two are, you know, one is sort of racially ambiguous and then Diane is, is darker skinned, but, but one thing that she made clear in this book is that it does not necessarily matter what you look like is not necessarily what you respond to or what you feel like or what you identify with. And I thought that was, it, she did that so well. She, it was such a, a complicated idea, you know, to, to have these three sisters who, who were all different. Um, I, I had the pleasure of interviewing her um, my story ran on Sunday in the Star Tribune, and, and you can find it pretty easily if you just go to our website. Um, but I wanted to read this quote from her that did not make it into the story because she and I talked for a long time. We talked for about an hour, and you can't always get to everything. But she, she, this was something that she was particularly interested in, was in this, this question of racial identity. And what she said to me was, the book is also interested in questions about Latinx identity and also whiteness. It raises the question, what does it mean to be white? Can you be white and Latinx? If so, what makes you white? Is it your affiliation or your experiences? Those are really rich questions that each of the daughters relates to differently, which is something else I was interested in because I think there are many families, mixed and otherwise, where different people in the family have different relationships to their identity, although they share common heritage and roots. Um, she said, our identification of what matters to us doesn't always align with how people see us. And that seemed to me to be a really important theme in this book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, when, when, when I read that quote earlier, you had shared it with me. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this idea of, you know, what are the differences between 
the way we see cultural identity or the way it functions in society and the way racial identity functions, right? So um, when I teach this course, I, I teach on um, writing diverse characters, I often talk about um, the differences and the way culture and race kind of come into play when we write about them. Mm -hmm. So culture um, by definition is just more real. So there are parts of culture that's more tangible, right? So, you know, there are elements of it that we can see, that we can experience. Um, and um, whereas I think that, so, so depending, of our, depending on our proximity to it, right? So, um, but I'll bring this back around to Noel, but I think with racial identity, it's a lot more fluid because, well, we know that race is a construct, right? Um, it's a social construct. And so there's a lot more fluidity in how we experience, especially those of us who are mixed race, like I am, um, you know, depending on the context, I can go from being, uh, you know, almost considered, you know, it, it, yeah, it, it, it all, it depends on, on context. Now with Noelle, you know, it's interesting because she's white presenting, right? And she is someone who um, struggles with that. She has to negotiate that. Um, and, and, but yet she sees herself as being aligned with issues that have to do with, you know, people who, you know, are, are marginalized, you know. Um, and so, but it, it's interesting with her Latinx culture, I found that um, she sort of picked and cho chose, she kind of, she, she wasn't very much, you know, exposed to it. And so, um, right. but she liked, she had the language, she had some of that language and she, so, you know, I, I think mostly what's going on in the book is this, is, is more of a racial identity issue. Um, and which I think is the, the issue that, you know, those of us who are mixed race tend to really grapple with, especially in America, right? Um, so, yeah, because many of us are already removed from our original cultures, I guess, in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, when Coster said to me, our identification of what matters to us doesn't always align with how people see us. I mean, that was Noelle, uh, kind of in a nutshell. I mean, she, she did look white, um, but she was completely on the side of, the, well, the, one of the other uh, Plots of the of the book is is that the, the high school where Noel attends and G attends um, is is going to be um, integrated. And here's Lacey May, the the mother of these mixed race daughters, who is out in front saying no, she does not want this. Um, and it's it's kind of shocking actually. <laughs> and and Noel, I mean, this is this is where Noel and her mother start having problems because Noelle thinks it's a good thing and she's kind of horrified that, that her mother is, is out there um, fighting against something that Noelle thinks is, is a good thing and would benefit people like her, you know? Um, but because she doesn't look the part, it's, it's, it's very subtle. It's, it's just a fascinating book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that, that then, there's also this, you know, the story of, of G, you know, who's a, an African-American uh, young man who's also uh, trying to make his way right, through this sort of integrated process, right? I mean, he finds himself in a school where he's, you know, he's one of very few black kids. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, and, and then he strikes up a relationship with Noel. And so, you know, that is uh, also an interesting angle to the whole racial element, right? Because they're also kind of, um, try, you know, I don't think he thinks of her as Latinx when he meets her. He thinks of her as a white person, you know, right. a white young woman. So, um, so I, I think that Costa has really, um, you know, moved into these very ambiguous moments um, in our time and in her, in her novel. And I think I, I really appreciated that. 
I uh, enjoyed that part of the novel because I tend to myself <laughs> tend to move into these rather ambiguous situations and try to make my way out of it, you know, just mentally too. So, yeah. Well, you know, she has an essay and I know that you have read this, but I would hope the audience would look at, at this as well um, in time.com where she talks about she's married to a man who I believe is Colombian and but he is white presenting and when they go back and forth um, between Colombia and the United States she's the one who gets pulled aside and um, you know asked the questions and you know which because she looks she looks um, well you see she looks black because she looks um, Latina she and he looks Afro white and so he's kind of left to to go scot-free and when she was, um, after they had their, their daughter and she was, you know, taking the, the baby places, people thought she was the nanny. Um, so there's, there's, I mean, there's, it just seems to affect so many parts of life, every part of life all the time. Um, and she, I think in the book, she, she, um, she writes about it so, in, it's very complex. And it's very delicate, and and she just does a, an amazing job. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that that she writes a lot about is the relationship between um, children and their mothers. I mean, this is this is also a big part of this book because you have the two single mothers. Well, Lacey May is not a single mother, but Robbie is gone. He's gone so much, and then she does um, take up with another guy, but he's not. The father of her children. She's essentially a single mom um, in many ways. And then Jade and G. Um, and and the the way these mothers struggle to take care of their children um, and the sacrifices that they make and the way that that trickles down and affects the children. Um, she had told me that initially she was going to write a book about two mothers, Lacey May and Jade. And um, the second chapter of the book is, it's a, it's a beautiful chapter of, of Lacey May when her children are very young. She, they're living in North Carolina and it's winter and it's cold and she does not have enough money to have the heat on. She's, she's running out of heating oil and, and she doesn't have any money and it's cold in the house and, and how she tries to make this into a game for the, for the kids, you know, they come home from school and let's go to bed and let's, you know, let's play this game where we're all, you know, in the blankets and it's, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> um, and she wrote that as a short story, a standalone short story, and it, and it became part of the novel. But the way that she had envisioned the novel about these two mothers, um, it, it didn't turn out that way. Um, she, she said that the children needed to be heard and they just sort of pushed their way forward um, in the novel. And it really became more about the children of these, these two mothers rather than the mothers themselves. Yeah, yeah I, I almost wish that I had you know, there was more about the lives of the mothers before they appeared mm -hmm. on the page, you know, I think um, maybe that's where she was going with the novel originally, she was going to explore their pasts and, you know, but, um, you know, the, the novel really kind of begins with the families, right, that the, the children are already right. there. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, there are these flashbacks, but there are not that many of them for the mothers. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting tidbit that we get from you. Yeah, it's always, you know, the story behind the story is always kind of fun to, to dig out. Um, I do want to remind um, the audience that, you know, please put, put uh, questions in the Q&A box if you have any questions that, that we can answer. Um, obviously, we are not, Naima, <laughs> but um, that's why we're here. Um, the, the also you know the, the the children in this book again she's she's pretty masterful about how she does this they they love their mothers they're loyal to their mothers but they are they are so angry at their mothers especially noel and it and it sort of starts with lacy may fighting against the integration of the school but it just kind of goes from there and it and it affects boy, the rest of her life i would say um and g as well i mean he's He's got this mother who is like buttoned down and hardworking and, you know, you don't give in to your feelings. 
and they never talk about Ray's death and and that affects him uh, quite profoundly um, in the book. He, as you said, he ends up doing things that he, because of the school, because he was in this better school, things that he may might not have ever been able to achieve um, in a poorer school, but boy, at what cost, you know, at what cost? Well, I, I think that what's happening there is the trauma. Um, you know, I think that, it's trauma passed down, um, you know, from mothers to their children, you know, um, and also I think with G, he witnesses the, the, the that moment um, when Ray is killed. And so, um, you know, I, I think that just is a specter that follows him. Um, it's, it's something that he just lives with as he gets older and it just never really leaves him, you know? And so I think there's something to be said about how trauma really does pass on um, through the generations and how, um, you know, it, it manifests itself in different ways, you know, um, repression, you know, anger, yeah. um, despair, um, you know, so, and I, 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 again, going back, I think Costa really does a, 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 a good job kind of capturing that um, in these two families. Yeah, he was a great character. So we have a question here. Um, an audience member says, I am a person of color. My child was recently called non-American by a couple of fellow second grade Caucasian classmates on her private school playground. Children are innocent and acquire racism by the function of the families they grow up in. I brought this to the school's attention, but what else could I do to bring such issues to light, to use it as a teaching moment for parents and communities? I would love for Lori and Angela to share perspectives on my question from the context of the book, but also what they think of how this incident falls into the current context. That's a huge question. Um, an excellent question. It is an excellent question. And especially as, as this person says in the con context of what's going on right now, um, that's a hard thing for one parent to do alone, I think. Um, I wonder if it's possible to gather um, a group of parents perhaps who might be affected in this way, who might be a little bit more um, aware and and have a meeting um these children are so young second grade well it's it's interesting within that to looking from within it's from inside the book i mean i'm just thinking about coster's um words and you know, just even tonight um and also thinking about the novel i think that you know, she read from a, a section where um, it was obvious that um, there was one side and then there was the other side. And they were sort of, you know, they were coming together and butting heads. And um, and I, I think that in that moment, it was the question of, you know, where are the others who can come in, step in mm -hmm. and help? Um, to fully integrate the school, you know, to help the kids who are, you know, um, are stepping into this situation that it puts them, you know, it, you know, they stand out, you know, they have to navigate, you know, this very wide space. Um, and so I think, you know, I think what Naima was trying to say in a way was that we do need that silent, <laughs> majority that's not or minority that's not there to, to step in and really you know uh, uh, help with that discussion you know that that can happen um, across you know great race racial differences and 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 all the all the issues so I'm not sure if I'm answering the question directly here but um, you know I think that allies we're looking for allies you know um, both inside and outside of school um, that can really, who can really help. Right. Well, I mean, and in the novel, you had a group of parents who were opposed to integration. So, you know, you kind of need a group that, like you say, is on the other side or is, 
is there to offer other perspectives and, and help and assistance. Um, I think we are out of time. This went so fast. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. And remember, there'll be another uh, series of talking volumes in the fall. We don't yet know who's going to be coming, but um, it would be great if that was real and not virtual, but that remains to be seen. So thank you so much. Um, thank you, Angela. It was a pleasure. Okay. <laughs>